All right. Well, those just joining us, you are just in time. We've got the famous Lloyd Carney on here. We are live and recording. It is May 4th, 2021. And um, the master of ceremonies himself is here to share with us one of his uh, most coveted classes. And I think uh, most helpful that uh, I love to always uh, sit in on is uh, HPR's condos, CCR's, oh my, any, any, of the, any of the acronyms, right? Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Hi, folks. Welcome. Welcome. Um, thank you, Teddy, for that great introduction. And I'm so sorry about being a couple minutes late. We had a great sales meeting today. Maybe many of you were there and uh, you saw that uh, we had a great time with some pretty good content. We ran a little long. So uh, thanks for hanging out and waiting for the class to get started. A um, couple housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, we, uh, if you have a question out there in TV land, like I'm gonna encourage everybody to do here in this room, please shout it out. Because if you, I am a lawyer, so if you wait for me to take a breath, we could be here all day before you get to ask your question, right? Uh, so just shout out the question, interrupt me, whatever you need to do, okay? Because I love the interactivity. I teach this class to attorneys and realtors, and I hate teaching it to attorneys. That's our private secret between you and me and everybody watching the video. Um, because attorneys really don't get in there and ask questions. Uh, attorneys are a little more of a quiet group. They're not active learners as a group like realtors are. Realtors are great at asking questions. And that's the reason I like teaching this class to realtors. Another housekeeping issue is I have these handouts here. Um, for those of you who have lived with me during a pandemic in the last year, you might remember this as something we dealt with a couple years ago called paper. This is uh, non-electronic data. And I have the paper models here for people in the room so that they can follow along with us. Uh, for everybody out there in TV land, I'm gonna be referring back to these things. Um, and you will receive a copy of this by way of Teddy after the, the class today. So you will have these resources made available to you, okay? The first one here is just a quick summary fact sheet. We're gonna go over all these details on the slide, but I wanted to create a one page refer back to document so that you don't have to manage you know, 20 slides when you go back, want to find out one or two details. It's probably gonna be summarized here for you on the fact sheet, which I have shamelessly put our logo on right there, okay? And then uh, I also have a white paper here that uh, some realtors have actually just ripped off the complete thing, the complete document here and put into their website or in their blog to talk about PUDs and HBRs. And I applaud that because we know that in, uh, in real estate, the R&D department is rip off and duplicate, right? That's all we do. Uh, so please rip this off, duplicate it, use it however you want to, even if you just send out an email blast with, hey, I just want to talk to you a little bit about uh, PUDs. But keep this in your toolbox, more importantly, because when you have a client that accidentally or on purpose looks at a PUD and then they have questions about, wait a minute, how do I share this lot with one to three other people? Um, you can send them this and it'll give them a quick summary and so I have one realtor that calls this his pub, Pud Whoopie. It's his Whoopie. He keeps going back to this document here because it's a quick way to explain that to clients. So know that those tools are available for you. So without further ado, Teddy, do you have any other points before we get started? No, sir. I'll be, uh, I'll be monitoring and looking. I'll be monitoring the chat as well. So if anything comes in, I'll be sure to, to jump there. So no, go ahead. That's Thank great. You. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to take off then. We're going to jump right into a little bit of the history. Whoops. There we go. Okay. So the Horizontal Property Act is what gives rise to our ability to do this. It's not just in Davidson County. It's not just in Middle Tennessee. It's a state statute. So this procedure exists all the way across the state of Tennessee. And it's Tennessee Code Annotated 6627101. Et sec just means everything in that chapter behind it too. And it was passed in 1963. 1963. Can you believe that? So prior to 2009, the Horizontal Property Act was the only statutory mechanism to create condominium style units in Tennessee. Okay. But the act also includes a one statute provision for planned unit developments. Okay. So think about the big picture. The big circle is horizontal property regime, HPRs. And the little circle inside of that is planned unit developments, okay? So every planned unit development is also a horizontal property regime, okay? Because that's in the bigger picture. And remember that little bitty circle inside the planned unit development section 
that's only a one statute provision. Actually, it's one half of one statute. And it, it's about one paragraph long that gives the ability to do this all the way across the state. So <clears throat> that was the Horizontal Property Act. So one other thing I wanna mention, the older style condominium buildings that you see in town, uh, like the Continental, I like to use them as an example, or Capitol Towers, um, those were all called condominiums in common language around uh, with realtors and with uh, clients who lived in them. They say, I live in a condo building, but it wasn't a true condominium in terms of the law. It was a horizontal property regime because that was the only mechanism that we had to create those condominium style units. But then that all changed in 2008 when they passed the Condominium Act of 2008. They did this because lawyers across the state of Tennessee and lobbyists were saying our condominium mechanism here in the state of Tennessee is antiquated and we need to update it. We need to catch it up to other acts, similar acts that have been passed in other states. So they did that in 2008. Uh, some people call the, even though it it's, should be called the Condominium Act of 2008, you may hear it called the Condominium Act of 2009 because it went into effect January 1st of 2009 which is important for us when we see these things out in the marketplace. Uh, and it is required to be used for any condominium project, which the master deed or declaration is recorded after January 1st, 2009. So if you think of 1212, for example, that is a new condominium building um, that was built after 2009. So that is under the new condominium act here, okay? So Capitol Towers is a horizontal property regime 1212 is a condominium. However, they look and behave the same way. It was just which version of the law that they went into effect under. One other point, if you're an old condominium, I, I don't know of any condominium that's done this, but you can opt in to the new condominium act if you want to. You can join the new club, but I don't know of any uh, horizontal property regime style condo out there in the market that has done that yet. Um, so, Let's talk about the terms HPR and PUD, because what we see in the marketplace, as a matter of fact, what we see in MLS is we call all style, all of these infill style developments HPRs. As a matter of fact, MLS deals with them in two ways, HPR attached and HPR detached, right? Everybody tracking so far? Good. So uh, H HPR, we know from the legal structure, from what we just talked about, is the broad umbrella to some minor terms that exist under that umbrella, okay? So the horizontal property regime law that passed back in the 60s, that includes those pre-2009 condos like Capital Towers, but it also includes that one statute provision, which is planned unit developments that allow us to do the infill, okay? So I just want you to know from a hyper-technical standpoint, when you say HPR, you uh, technically don't only mean just those infill projects that we normally refer to, but you're also referring to Capital Towers because that is also technically an HPR, okay? When I get hyper-technical about it, I call them an HPR PUD. And sometimes in emails, you'll see me say that. It's like, why is he using, you know, the full Christian name for these things? And it's because I want to specifically say that I don't mean Capital Towers, I only mean these infill provisions. So I'm, I'm going to call it an HPR PUD in most, most times that I first bring up the subject in an email or a conversation, okay? So here's another way to think about it, um, because this can be a very confusing subject, but I've had a lot of feedback that this analogy really brings it home to people. So an HPR is to a PUD what a Toyota is to a Prius, okay? An HPR is to a PUD what a Toyota is to a Prius. So if I called this a Toyota, I'm right. But I haven't really given the listener an accurate, uh, like a specific idea of what it could be. It could be a pickup truck. It could be a Sequoia. But if I say I'm, I'm driving a Toyota Prius today, I've given them a more accurate, you know, uh, mindset of what, what I'm talking about, okay? So just remember, if you hear it out there in the marketplace, if they call it an HPR, they're not wrong. If they call it a, a PUD, they're not wrong. Just like you can call this a Toyota or a Prius. Make sense? So that's our terminology. Now that we have a basis of terminology for this, let's talk about the essentials of a PUD, okay? 
Now, this section right here is where a lot of questions usually start to develop. So as you have questions form in your mind, even if you're uh, watching this on TV, go ahead and take off the mute button and ask the question when you have it, because somebody else in the room probably has the same question. And by the way, if you're in TV land, everybody in the room here can hear you speaking over the speakers too, so I won't have to repeat your question. So the essentials of a PUD are, under Tennessee Code Annotated 6627-103, all planet, planned unit developments shall require. Now, shall is a very important word. It's almost a magic word in, in the legal community because it means it is the most superlative form of a requirement when you use the word shall, okay? That means there's no other options. They must have these components. Uh, number one, a declaration. A declaration is the statement with all of the rules and, and uh, regulations about that community that are built into the governing document. The bylaws, the bylaws are an attachment to that declaration most all the time. And that's how the leadership of that HOA is gonna manage itself. A plat showing private and common elements and a plat sometimes referred to as a site plan, okay? Private and common elements on it, has to have both. There has to be a townhouse corporation, okay? A townhouse corporation. And that's a corporation that's set up with the Secretary of State, just like you were starting up a company in Nashville or in Tennessee. It has to have a charter, and a charter is a requirement to start a townhouse corporation. So four and five are almost intertwined. And then finally, six, an attorney's opinion. An attorney opinion. Most of the time, in the last 10 years, as we've been developing these, as an, a, a community of attorneys, we've decided to get uh, a little more structured about the way that we do attorney opinions. And we usually take most of these things that you see right here in this list, including the attorney opinion, and put it into the one recordable document that we publish in the Register of Deeds office and that you can also find through Davidson County Metro Mapping. Okay, most of the time, I'll say most of the time. Okay, now notice up there in number three, that's plat showing private and common elements. I put an asterisk in there because under private elements, there's a sneaky seventh element that they have baked into the private element there, okay? And I'm gonna talk more about that once we get over to the requirements for uh, private elements, okay? So just know that there is also a sneaky seventh element. So because these are so important, and I go back to these all the time, when uh, Connie and Roger and uh, the team here, other lenders many times ask me, I need you to give me an attorney opinion. Is this a PUD or is it a condo? And of course, Roger, what's, what's the value there? What do we want it to be, a PUD or a condo? From we want it to be a PUD, that's right, but why? From the horse's mouth, tell them why that is. Yeah, and it can kill the loan based on the answers that they give in the condo questionnaire. Yeah, yeah. And so out there in TV land, if you didn't happen to hear that, uh, Roger said that if it's a PUD, you treat it just like a single family home, okay? But if it's a condo, there are several hurdles that you have to cross, which are gonna create, possibly increase your interest rate, increase your expenses for the condo questionnaire, and could possibly kill the deal, okay? So that's the reason it is incredibly important to lenders uh, to find out if this thing, if, if a, a subject property is a PUD or a condo on the front end. And so when I get that question and I'm determining whether it's a PUD or a condo, I always go back to this list right here, which by the way, is the first box on your quick fact sheet right here. The six factors on whether it is a, uh, if it's a PUD. And I go back and I just make sure that all of these elements are present, okay? So those are the six factors there. Very, very important to the discussion today. So uh, under private elements here, if you look at this section carefully, I want you to find the, the part that's in italics, okay? It's gonna be about eight lines down in that paragraph, about middle of the paragraph. And it starts off with uh, private elements shall exist only where each apartment in the project has a ground floor and there are no apartments located above or below the private element 
except the one apartment located thereon. Okay. So let me summarize that or paraphrase it a little bit. A private element is required by a PUD, okay? And this tells us that a private element mean, means a dwelling where there is nothing, no other dwelling above it, no other dwelling beneath it, okay? And another way to say that is when you have a private element, that means private elements cannot be stacked one on top of the other, okay? So that's useful for us in the marketplace as we're driving around, we can look at some things, like if I'm driving by 1212, I can look at the balconies and say, oh, I can easily determine that those units are stacked right there, okay? So because I know the definition of private element and that PUDs and with private elements cannot be stacked, I know immediately that 1212 cannot be a PUD, can't possibly be a PUD. And I'll give you another example. I had a realtor call me with a client that had a home that they had divided up into two dwellings, okay? These two dwellings, uh, it was eligible for a two dwelling unit because it was uh, an R property, not an RS property. RS properties in Davidson County zoning require only single family residences, okay? But this was an R property. So we knew that it was eligible for two dwellings on the same lot. They took one massive home and divided it into those two dwellings essentially creating a duplex. And they asked me if I would create the horizontal property regime HUD documents to divide that up so they could be sold to different owners. And I said, I need to ask some more questions. Can you tell me a little bit more about what's going on with the unit? And they said, oh, well, what we did is we just took the upstairs and we made one property. We took the downstairs, which was the basement with lots of light and exposure on the backside. And we made that another dwelling. Well, what does that tell you based on it can't be stacked here? What do you think? Could I turn that into a PUD? No, the answer is no, I can't. Because the definition of private element here tells me that they can't be stacked. Now, if they had divided that home up vertically, put a vertical separation line in it so that it had two front doors going in, and when you get inside of each dwelling, it can have an upstairs and downstairs within the dwelling, but it can have no other dwelling above it and no other dwelling beneath it, okay? So townhomes are fine. Don't get confused about stairs. It's all about, is there a separate dwelling above it that belongs to someone else? Or is there a separate, separate dwelling beneath it? And then if that's the case, it cannot possibly be a pub, it must be a condo, okay? Any questions so far? All right, you guys are just soaking it in today. So here's what common elements are, but I'm gonna talk about common elements, not by going through this, but more in terms of exclusion, okay? Mm -hmm. So common elements are gonna be everything else on the property that is not a private element or a limited common element, okay? So think about it like that. Now you can go through this and read this through this on your own, and I encourage you to do that. But for purposes of brevity today, We've already talked about private elements and that's the lot area upon which the apartment is located. So that's the footprint of the dwelling of a PUD, okay? The footprint of the dwelling. If you think about, if you were uh, looking at a top-down photo, which a site plan many times is, and you know where the footers are, that's probably the outside boundary of the private element, okay? But limited common elements, that includes those common elements which are agreed upon by all the co-owners to be reserved exclusively for the use of one or more uh, occupants or of the dwellings, okay? Now, what that means for us in, in uh, usable terms out there in the marketplace, we know that most of these PUDs and HDRs, they take one lot and what do they do? They draw a line right down the middle, don't they? Pretty much. And then they have one dwelling on the right, one dwelling on the left, okay? And then the yards are divided the same way, okay? We can see the private element within that division and then the yard space on either side of that division on those two unit PUDs are reserved for the homeowner that lives on that half of the lot. So that's what we see most often. And that's kind of what we're gonna think about as we start this discussion. Uh, so the limited common element uh, for the left dwelling is gonna be the yard space generally on the left half of that property, okay? Now that you've got your mind wrapped around that, of course, in Nashville, everybody wants to be a unicorn and have the different property, or our properties come to us as unicorns and we have to do different things. 
So we also know that sometimes we have properties that are divided front to back or divided in even more creative ways. And they can be as long as they have the minimum requirements for zoning and codes to uh, build the dwelling that they're looking to build. Okay. So to recap this piece, remember the private element is the footers of the property or the footprint of the home where the home actually sits. The limited column, common elements are the, the yard space reserved for that particular homeowner usually, okay? And then by exclusion, the regular common elements are is everything else, which is gonna be any yard space that is shared yard space for all of the people on the lot to use in conjunction with one another. And we're gonna see some of that coming up. Yes, first question. Yeah, so if it's, you know, when you say undivided. Yeah, that happens. That's right, yeah. So uh, I want you to be, your clients will look at fences as, uh, as uh, a presumption of the property line, okay? And don't get your mind wrapped around fences too much because we know that I can put up a fence in my yard anywhere I want to, and I haven't given away any land by doing that. I can, in the middle of a, a one acre backyard, I can put a 10 by 10 dog pen and I haven't given away the rest of my property, right? Okay. Similarly, I can go right to the edge, but come six inches off. And as long as I maintain that area and treat it like it's mine outside the fence, that's still my land. Okay. So uh, the situation you brought up kind of dovetails with that because what you're saying is you've got a client that's looking at a, uh, an HDR that has no fences on it whatsoever. And what does that mean? Well, it, you go back to the site plan which is in, in that recorded in that HDR. And it's gonna tell you the land that is reserved for their use, even though it doesn't have a fence on it. So you can uh, draw an analogy of what if you buy a single family lot um, that doesn't have a fence on it? Well, you still have your yard space that you can use and it's still separated from the neighboring lot. In this case, it's still separated legally that way, but it's legally by agreement in the declaration that that half of the unfenced yard space is gonna be reserved for that dwelling owner. Well, it should not be an undefined HOA, okay? Now, uh, that just may be a terminology issue that we're missing each other on. But remember back here on the six elements, there has to be a townhouse corporation. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm really glad you brought this up because in the marketplace, you'll hear developers are notorious for saying what? There is no HOA, right? How many people have ever heard that with HDR or HUD? More than half the people in the room because developers love to say that. And I, if I were their counsel, I would fine tune their language and say that there is no active HOA. And I think that's a true statement with most all HDR HUDs in town because most of these guys are not having meetings and they're not collecting dues, okay? So if that's what you mean by an undefined HOA, you're exactly right, yeah. That's right. And some people have even called those zombie HOA because they're not doing anything. They just exist purely for the purpose of satisfying this statute right here. And it's a great question and I'm so glad you asked it. Yeah. So, uh, but just know that even though there's no meetings, there's no dues being collected and maybe even the homeowners that haven't even read the declaration or abide by its rules. Those rules are still in place and they're recorded in the Register of Deeds office and you can get to those through Metro Mapping, and I'll give you a little tip on getting that done later, um, where you can pull those up and provide them to clients. Also remember that there's some contractual duties built into the regular contract. So if it's a PUD, if you are listing a PUD, you're required to disclose that. Your clients are required to disclose that to all future buyers at some point in the transaction. Most of the time that happens on the property condition disclosure statement, but it can also happen on the exemption form. Okay, so just know that that has to be disclosed. And if they request a copy of the declaration as the listing agent, you have to provide it. So your title partner can definitely help you with that, but the easier way to do it rather than wait for, cause you know, sometimes title gets behind, sometimes it takes them a while to get back in touch with you. Um, if you can go to Metro Mapping in Davidson County where a lot of these pubs exist, 
you or chances are about 80% you can pull that plug yourself and you won't have to depend on anybody else to get it done. Okay, great, great question. I love questions like that. Um, so let's talk about attached or detached. By the way, before I go on, are there any other questions about private elements, limited common elements, or purely common elements? We'll dig into it a little deeper when we get to site plans, but for right now, those are our basic, our basic terms that we're gonna use to move forward. So attached or detached has been a hot issue. So, um, and we know that, that we have these in the marketplace. We know just by looking at the MLS categories that we have detached and uh, attached and detached HPRs, PUDs out there in the marketplace. So prior to 2000, the two family dwellings were traditionally built with a common wall. And this is an actual property out there in Nashville, 11546 Avenue North. Um, when I built this portion of my presentation, all of these homes were actually active on the market at that time. Now, this was about three years ago that I put this portion of the, the presentation together. So hopefully they've sold by now. God knows in this market they should have. Uh, but this one right here looks exactly like what you would expect out of an early onset uh, duplex, okay? Um, you can take any duplex like this in town that is not yet an HPR or HUD you can represent a client to buy it, or you can buy it yourself and hire someone like me to come in and put a, a declaration in place and all of those six factors to make it sellable, okay? So let's talk about traditional duplexes versus HBR PUDs. Does anybody, for extra credit in the room or out there in TV land, does anybody know the real difference between what we call a duplex and what we call an HBR PUD? What is the fundamental difference there? It is extra credit because I haven't talked about this yet. So the difference is with a duplex, both dwellings of the duplex have to have only one owner, okay? And that means there's only one tax map, map and parcel number for both dwellings, okay? They don't have their own individual tax map and parcel number, okay? They only have one and it covers both dwellings. So duplex, one owner only, okay? But you can buy that duplex, hire somebody like me to come in and file an HBR PUD declaration. And when I file that, it uh, gets the, um, the tax authority here in Nashville busy and they start applying a separate tax map and parcel number to it. So they will split it up. Usually one unit will retain the old tax map and parcel number and they'll assign a new one to the dwelling beside it. And if you go into Metro mapping, you'll see that happen. One day, it'll be one big tax map and parcel for the whole lot. The next day when you go in, you'll see smaller tax map and parcels that are only the footers of each of the dwellings. And then all the yard space becomes, you know, commonly owned property, okay? So that is the two family dwellings. And that is the attached version of uh, what was going on prior to 2000. Okay. And then we went into what I call a hybrid phase in 2000 to 2014. And these numbers are approximate because, of course, it was a, a slow warm up to actually getting to this phase. Um, national builders were getting increasingly clever at making the dwellings minimally attached. And we call those umbilical cords back during that uh, phase. And I think that was a term that a lot of builders came up with because they were trying to figure out what is the absolute minimum level of attachment that I'm gonna put these two homes together with to satisfy the uh, county regulations by ordinance, but still be able to make them look and feel like separate single family homes, okay? And you can see this example here on Lombardy. Is that how you pronounce that? Lombardy, Lombardy? I don't know. Lombardy, okay. Um, so this is 2002 Lombardy, and you can tell they have planted a tree there. Maybe that's a, a, a foster holly that's grown really high, I'm not sure. But that tree shrub right there kind of separates those two homes and it makes it look separated from the street. But if you look at the top down map there, you can see units A and B are connected in the back. Um, a lot of times builders, because they were getting clever, they wanted these connection common walls to be non-essential portions of the home. It would be a laundry room. It would be something with minimal noise so you didn't get noise bleed over into the two units. A lot of times they would connect them in the back with garages although we can see this one has a garage in the front, so we know that's not the case. So 
Um, this is a really good example of you know uh, that umbilical cord style of development from 2000 to 2014. But then Metro Council at the county level, now remember we're talking county now for attached or detached versus PUD HPRs at the state level. The county got together and they passed uh, Metro Nashville uh, Bill BL 2014-770, which you can pull up and look at, signed by the mayor and the whole business. And it eliminated the attachment requirement for two family dwellings. That happened in May of 2014. Now, for those of us who were in the marketplace, either as, even possibly as a homeowner, a citizen in the community paying attention, or a realtor, we know that uh, that was when the term uh, tall skinny was getting thrown around and it really got traction as being uh, symptomatic of an unattractive dwelling by some people. They would call them tall skinnies. And so this legislation did a lot of things. Uh, it eliminated the attachment requirement that you'll see. It also required six feet of separation. So not only can it not be attached, but you must have three feet on either side of the line in order to make it detached. Now, for that to make sense, you have to think about fire code, okay? Since they're gonna be detached, they wanted to have some airspace down between these units so that they, uh, fires didn't jump one to the other. It also limited the height of structures to be 150% of the width. And that bullet point right there speaks to what they were trying to deal with in terms of eliminating the tall and skinny component of these bills. So it limited the height of the structures to 150% of the width. We still hear tall skinny in the marketplace, right? Yeah, I'm not the only one hearing that. I'm getting some nods out there. But they are not as tall and not as skinny as they used to be because of this requirement right here. So we just call them, I don't know, what do you want to call them? Uh, tall and husky, something like that? Yeah, husky. Yeah, I feel like I need husky jeans right now for my birthday. So. The last point is existing dwellings could remove the umbilical cord attachment without regard to height, okay? So that means if we go back here to Lombardi and they uh, decide that they want to, this connector is not essential, maybe it's storage or something like that. And they're like, we really hate each other. We want to separate these homes. We're ready to tear this down and hire a contractor to just put up brick. They could do that after 2014 and uh, they could do it without regard to height. So they could have a truly tall skinny that ended up being detached. Um, so it could sidestep that if they want to go in and uh, do some reparative work to that unit. And by the way, this right here is uh, home, our homes in Madison. And that is the detached with six feet of separation between them. So by the way, takeaway here, if you're ever out walking around at the putter HBR, um, that you're looking at in the marketplace and your client is like, oh, these are really close together. Um, you can say with confidence, well, they must be by ordinance, six feet in separation. So you know that. And if you happen to be six feet tall or 5'11", you can lay down between the two properties, check that out, you know, or make your client do it. Uh, one thing to think about though, if you're out there looking at things that have side uh, accoutrements, like maybe an HVAC pad that's notorious for being on the side of the property. That isn't counted in the six feet of separation. It's only the footers, the structure of the dwelling. There could also be a side porch that isn't counted or a balcony hanging off the top that isn't counted. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, that was a controversy, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. It was. They were doing bump outs. Okay. So it wasn't a balcony. So balconies, decks, and porches are considered limited common elements and they are, uh, they are collateral to the structure of the dwelling. But what they look at is the enclosed space. That's what codes uses. And they had some, they had a codes inspector in the nations that was either under informed or he was being a cowboy. And he was allowing builders to lead off base a little bit by doing these bump outs of enclosed space and not counting that as being an encroachment on the setback requirement. And this six feet foot separation is a setback requirement. Now, the, the cure for that has been noisy, ugly, and non-standard. The city was put in a situation where 
they had to go back and ask some homeowners to remove their bump outs. They did some of that. They uh, allowed exceptions for others. And it's it's been noisy and awful. I don't have a good answer for you. It wasn't just one builder. It was it was an assortment of builders. Yeah, and I feel certain that builders got sued, even though I didn't investigate that. I feel certain that it happened. Um, and then the builder's natural defense to that lawsuit was, I built it to the approval and the blessing of the codes department. So now that you own it, codes has come back and done something different. And so that's why the city was put in an awful position because they were put in the position to hold someone accountable who wasn't responsible for the issue that, that arose. And so that's why they were trying to uh, quietly grant as many exceptions as they could for those issues. Yeah, but if you run into that, that happened in the nations, um, you might want to, if you see a bump out on the side of the property that encroaches on the six foot dwelling, you might want to do a little more uh, investigation um, to make sure that there has been an exception made for that or get some kind of communication with the codes department that that won't be an issue. Yeah, but that, in my experience, that only happened up in the nation's area in that footprint where the one codes inspector that was a cowboy was doing his work. And I think he's a greeter at Walmart now. So, yeah, Not, nothing against any greeters at Walmart. They do a great job. I love being greeted when I come to Walmart. Uh, so zero lot lines. Uh, this is the next subject that kind of gets confused with PUD property. Remember, circling back, we've already talked about duplexes that are not PUDs, okay? And they get confused with PUDs because they're two dwellings on one lot. But we know that duplexes have to be owned by one owner and PUDs can be owned by two. And then you have zero lot lines. Zero lot lines are a lot more confusing because those are essentially what the mechanism that we use to create the same thing that we're creating now in calling them PUDs, but we did this back before August 1st of 1984, okay? So a zero lot line was a tool that we could use in Davidson County to create two attached dwellings that looked just like a duplex, but make them individually alienable or sellable to two different people. And we called that uh, a um, zero lot line. Now the full Christian name of a zero lot line is there in blue for you. It's a zero foot, side setback on internal lot lines. But because anytime we say something three times in one day, we come up with an abbreviation for it, right? And we're great at that in our realtor community. Um, so we call it zero lot line. So now you know both, and most people have kind of forgotten the Christian name for this thing, and they just call it a zero lot line, but that's the full name. And as the second bullet point says, essentially these are duplexes allow for separate ownership of each dwelling unit. And, uh, and any a separate map and parcel identifier for properties built before 1985 on one lot like this is probably a zero lot line. Probably a zero lot line, okay? Now, how you're gonna know this when you look in the public record or you look in Metro Mapping is where you go to find in Metro Mapping a uh, PUD declaration, you're not gonna find a declaration there. You're gonna find a plat and a plat map that shows two dwellings bumped right up next to each other. And when you see a plat in the uh, public records where you would expect to see a declaration, you need to have an antenna or hairs in the back of your neck that stands up and says, oh, that's probably a zero lot. And you can look down on the plat because every plat, even though some of them are hard to read, um, you'll see a date on the plat. And I will almost guarantee you in all times, it's gonna be prior to August 1st, 1984. If you see that, that's going to be a, uh, a uh, zero lot line. Now, uh, let's talk about another term, grandfathered. So all of those uh, zero lot lines, are they still legal? Is there any danger in buying them? No, they're not, because those are grandfathered in. And another term, what nerdy lawyers like me say, instead of saying grandfathered, we call them legal nonconforming, okay? So that means that they're non-conforming, meaning that you can't build that type of de uh, development or dwelling right now, but they're legal because they have been grandfathered in. Legal non-conforming, okay? Meaning they existed prior to August 1st of 1984. I'm gonna skip this because uh, this is, you'll, you're gonna get these slides afterwards and I want you to read through this. And this is an, an experienced attorney in town that wrote a letter to a lender that was just having heartburn over this 
I will say that this was a lender that does not have Roger and Connie's expertise with HBRs and PUDs. They were an out of county lender that is, you know, if you're used to lending in Murray County, you just don't run into these things, okay? And if you come into a marketplace like this, this can really give you some heartburn. Well, this lender had heartburn. And so this was an attorney that was, has been practicing in Tennessee since I was in junior high school. And, uh, and he kind of walked through some of the history of how this development took place and the pre-2008 condominium style dwellings. So read through that on your own. And is that applause or rain? Oh, okay. All right. Just a crop up. I uh, know uh, it's not that interesting. Don't applaud. It's, it's a great idea to not applaud. So let's talk about some site plans. Now, this is where we get into the fun part. We have done all the hard work of hitting the books and learning the terms, learning terminology, learning why we say the things that we do, and even things that are not PUDs that but kind of look like PUDs that confuse us in the marketplace. So now we get to actually look at site plans. So I would challenge you when you have one of these things and you pull the declaration, the most important thing to you and the most important thing to your client, useful thing to your client is gonna be the site plan because we are, most of us are visual humans and we love visual representations of what's going on on the property. And so the site plan, remember, if we go way back here to our requirements, you see that uh, three plat showing private and common elements. That's exactly what we're seeing here that's baked into the site plan. I use this version from Clint Elliott because I think it is a great tool to look at to show all three elements that we talked about. And those three elements are the private element where the home sits, the limited common element reserved for the exclusive use of one homeowner, one or more homeowners, and then the common element, which is available for all homeowners on the lot to use, okay? So I'm gonna stand up and you know what, let me point this over here. Hopefully that doesn't give us any tunnel effect going because I wanna point at this guy over here um, we can see on this site plan right here, we have unit B and unit A, okay? And unit B's limited common element is here, all right? Now, bear in mind that this is the road here. This is Summit Avenue. Unit A is kind of from Summit Avenue. That was on the left. Unit B is on the right. And we can see from the alley, we have a shared drive that's coming off here, okay? Now, we can also see from the shared drive, we have pull-offs so that each homeowner, as they come into park, can park on their limited common element that is reserved for their exclusive use, okay? So let's talk about our elements here. The private element, you remember I told you, that's the footer of the home of where the dwelling sits. And so we can see that that's clearly defined right here. We have a limited common element, meaning the unit B owner, they can come barbecue in this on their turnaround right here. They can barbecue in this section. They can even barbecue in the front yard right here. But what they cannot do by agreement in the declaration is go over and barbecue over here in this section. Okay? They can only do it out here. Unit B can set up a car swing and a tree that's right here that we don't want to see. Okay? But they can't hang their car swing over here in this yard because that's reserved for the exclusive unit piece of unit A. Okay? Now, what about right here? This is a common element. And you really have to dig into the nuts and bolts of the, uh, of the declaration to, to see where the limitations are here. But I can tell you that about 95% of them, you can use this area, but you cannot occupy this area to the exclusion of other homeowners. Okay? And in terms of drive, that's where we see it a lot. So what does that mean? If I'm pulling in here to park, can I park right here? He says, no, I agree with it. Yeah, you cannot park right here. You can pull on up and pull off on your turnaround, but you can't use this space right here to the exclusion of the other homeowners. Now, practically, that might not mean a whole lot, okay? Because these guys, these guys or girls or families might live and work well together. They might you know, keep each other's kids and they may have guests that come in and they don't even ask the other way. They just pull up as far as they can and they block the area right there. That might be what happened in actual practice. You might hear a listing uh, where the agent talks about that going on, and that's just fine. But just know that 
when it comes down to the rule book, which is the declaration, probably going to say they cannot occupy this space here. Right? Now let's talk about insurance. Because you know, insurance is very important to uh, your clients, very important to the mortgage lender that's going to be in the transaction, more than likely. And it's pretty important to title, too, because that's where the attorneys are that are going to sort of the transaction. So um, if you get a typical homeowner's policy, it's going to cover any peril that occurs in the private element. Okay. If you get a typical homeowner's policy for a HBR HBR, it's also every underwriter right now is telling me that it also covers you for any peril that occurs in a space of yard that is reserved for your exclusive use. Okay. So if you put a tire swing up out here and you have some insurance related disaster that you can make a claim related to that tire swing, you can do that. And underwriters are telling me today that they will pay that claim as long as there's not another exception on the policy. Okay. So Insurance will pay here, it will pay here. It will not pay here, okay? So your clients that are buying these properties with common elements, you need to be aware of that, okay? And that could be acceptable risk to them, okay? Your client could be fine with, you know, there's not really anything, this is an absolute flat piece of land, it's concrete, I don't think there's any peril that's going to happen in that little sliver of property right there where I can get sleep. But you might have a hypersensitive client that has slipped and fallen on ice every year since 1976. And they know that when ice covers up this turnaround, they're going to slip and fall. And it's going to be keystone cops. So everybody come in. And they want that to be insured. So for clients like that, they can, by themselves, obtain their own insurance policy. Okay. They just have to contract with a special separate policy you put from their insurance provider to cover that space. Or what we see happen more often than not is they share their concerns with the homeowner and they get together through the HOA and they buy a coverage policy for this right here. Now I live in one of these myself. I live in a four unit HOA that spreads itself across two lots. And in the rear, of all four of those dwellings, we have uh, 15 feet off of the alley that is just paved all the way across. And that is common area, kind of like this right here. But as you can imagine, it's kind of an area like that all the way across the back of the state that everybody can park on, okay? Now, mine's a little, well, I don't need to say on camera, I'm sorry. Uh, mine's a little different in that uh, the developer had to give special consideration to the seller of the property when they built it. The seller of the property was Sun Records down in the Belmont Hillsborough area. If you're familiar with the Belmont area and uh, Martin's Barbecue, I live right behind Sun Records right there. So if you're ever in the neighborhood, come over, get a glass of wine. I'll be there. I'm at 15, 19 plate. Okay. So while you're there, yeah, don't slip and fall on my back porch. Okay, please, please. But if you do, I have an insurance policy. If you slip and fall in the alley back here. While you, uh, after I've given you eight glasses of wine and you don't know how to walk anymore, okay, you slip and fall back there. I've got an insurance policy that's going to cover that. Um, and part of the reason is because Sun Records retained an easement right there, an easement right to park across the back of the alley. Now, easements are beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about right now, but just, in, just for purposes of example and clarification, we got the insurance policy chiefly because of all the patrons of Sun Records that could come in. We talked about it openly and frankly with the four units, and we said if it was just the four of us and our people that came to visit us, we would probably just self-insure, not worry about it, not worry about slips and falls on ice and that kind of thing. But since we have some records, we're going to do the insurance policy. So that's the way we do it. And the cost for that is for all four units and all that big expanse of land there, uh, it costs us five hundred dollars a year, or about one hundred and twenty-five dollars per home per year to do that. And we don't do it through regular HOA collections. We just do a special assessment every year. Everybody just kind of throws money in a hat and get it paid and we're done. Okay? So that's an example of insurance. And insurance is a big concern with a lot of homeowners or new purchasers. So remember, typical insurance covers here and here, but it will not cover you in a common element like that. Okay? Yes? When you are correct. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, it is. Yeah, it is in a sense, and I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, we're not so active, you know. We like to think that we're active. We're about as. If I could give you an analogy, we're about as active as a golfer. You know, we're not. We're not true athletes out there. Um, I would say that we. What we do is just we meet on a back porch, and sometimes we don't even all meet together um, because we've got two of our homeowners that one lives in New York, the other one lives over in Silicon Park, and they lease their units. So sometimes uh, me and Jesse, which is the other the on-site homeowner, we'll get together, have a barbecue, and we'll FaceTime with one of the others, text with one of the others, and we just do it all informally. And we're like, yeah, we're, we need the other $125. I'm pretty good with that. Yeah, we are. On structure, on the paper, though, I am the president of the HOA, just because every, when they ask for volunteers, everybody else took a step back, I think. So, and, you know, just because of my skill set, they said, you're probably our guy. So, um, but it's not a lot to do. It's just pay that bill every year. Yeah, good question. Yeah. What happens when someone like to talk to uh, someone? Is it usually that there's no shared bargain? I was told that they could stop after a year from development. So it looks like this? Correct. Yeah. Something like that. There yeah, just completely area. divided, no common area. Right. Yeah. They can't dissolve it. Okay. They can't. Yeah, that, that's something else I hear in the marketplace. And I'm going to take you back to this right here. If If they dissolve it, then they have something that they probably can never sell. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. they'll never be able to get a mortgage loan on it. The next time when, when that client goes to list it and Roger asks me, hey, can, you know, is this a condo or a client? I'm gonna say, I don't have a good answer for you. I think this is an illegal subdivision now because they have dissolved the, the town house corporation that the Tennessee Code annotated says shall be there. So this is the thing. There's no, if you, as long as, well, let me say this a different way. Um, there's no real good reason to dissolve it as long as everybody's okay with an HOA construct being there that nobody avails themselves to, okay? You can never, ever um, achieve separate lots, their own individual lot numbers for those two dwellings so that it can be dissolved. So the only thing is, if you go in and mutually terminate this uh, PUD declaration, that can be done if you get both homeowners and both mortgage lenders to sign off on the termination. It can be done, but you are left with an absolute mess. Yeah. I'm assuming they're not paying, they're not paying dues, 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 Separate, it's not like A, B, whatever. It's new, absolutely new numbers. Whatever right. Because then they are in violation of this statute. Because you have two dwellings that are on the same lot that are purported to be owned by different owners. Yeah. And it would be, uh, th this is just a sneaky little loophole that they've got. And I, I kind of call it a loophole because it gets you out of a lot of obligations that you would have to use to go before Metro planning to get a true subdivision done. Okay, so you're not subdividing lots here. You're just building two dwellings where two dwellings are already okay to build on an R lot. Okay, you're building two dwellings where two dwellings can already be built. You're just doing it in such a way that you can sell those two dwellings to different and so if you dissolve this, then you can no longer sell those units to different people. They have to have one map and parcel number for both units. Yeah. Now, I guess you could take it to, you know, I'll, because you do such great work, I always try to find a way to make you right. Okay. And you can dissolve this as long as you also go to Metro Planning and convince them that you're going to get they need to give you two separate lots and do a subdivision. Right. But I would do the subdivision first and then simultaneously terminate the, the HPR to do it. Yeah, and it would be extremely difficult because 
remember you would have to get the mortgage lenders to sign off on it too because they have a security interest in this property they have a security interest in the legal description which the legal description for these things say that is the property as noted on the plan unit development declaration of record so that's what they've loaned on and if you go in there and materially start changing the legal structure of what they loaned on yeah you could throw them into heartburn pretty quick but i'm so glad you asked that question because I really get that a lot. It's like, you know, it's already built. You know, we kind of use this as a loophole to get around this stuff, but the state of Tennessee and the codes department, I mean, the code, codes can come out and technically give you a codes violation if they catch up with the construct, you know, with, the, with what you've got, you know. We, we have terminated these before. Um, we, in cases where we have, usually, they are owned outright by the owners. We're just lucky enough to have two cash owner buyers on either side of it. So we don't have mortgage lenders to deal with. And uh, we terminated it so we can put in a new one and create it in a way that they wanted to be created. Like for instance, maybe they wanted uh, a new site plan with different things on it and, and change things remarkably. You can also amend them. A lot of times that's a whole lot easier. Uh, you can amend them for things like we want to uh, now allow for or prohibit short-term rentals. We say that a lot. Or we want to modify the limited common element on a site plan just a little bit. And we've hired a uh, surveyor to come in and give us a new survey. Maybe we went and hired Cornelia because we already know that he has this drawing in his uh, computer and it's gonna take him relatively little effort to go in and modify this a little bit, you know? Uh, maybe this home right here, when the developer built it, he never actually built a driveway right here. He ended up doing something different, but just never modified the site plan. And the homeowners say, well, we want to do away with the top element, but we just want to continue the straight line down here and make it limited on both sides. So we don't have to worry about insurance, we're all good. That'd be a great opportunity for an amendment. And we do that a lot. I've got another one coming up that we actually had to do an amendment on, and there's a flaw in the site plan. And I'll show you that one uh, right now. How about that one? So this is on South Street. These were gorgeous homes, by the way. Uh, you know, South Street is our median road right off of Music Row. Okay, everybody kind of know where South Street is? Yeah. Uh, and so this is an alley over here, 15th Avenue on this side, and big, nice, rounded corners right here, and nice expanse of grass around it. So it kind of felt like it was on a little peninsula, right? These were beautiful homes that had rooftop decks. You could see these grow from the rooftop decks in every story. Okay. Um, they were, I think, somewhere between uh, 900,000 and 1.1, somewhere in that zone. Okay. So there is a flaw. I'm going to take a little coffee break while you guys look at it and tell me what you think the flaw is to this site plan. And I don't blame Clint Ellie at all because he just kind of drew what was there. I'll give you a clue if you need a clue. It has to do with parking. If you see it, just raise your hand, shout it out. There's no shared? Yeah, there is no shared. You were on the right path. I'm not sure who that was out there in TV land, but we all heard you and you were on the right path. So You're there is no shared. Yeah. So if I am an occupant of 1503, and here's my car, I can pull it right in here and pull it into my parking, right? No problems. But what if I'm the occupant of 1501? What do I do? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And so the comment was, there is no comment. And that was, that was really the solution that we needed here. Now, there could be another harder solution that was raised in one of these classes before. Um, if you go right here and take this section and turn that into a common element, that means both homeowners get to use that, right? They both get to come off the alley. They both get to travel anywhere they want to in this section. And then this homeowner can go over here, this homeowner can go over here, okay? Conceptually, by the way, these had parking garages in them up here too. So they can pull into their garage or they can just pull off on that turnaround right there. And that was the solution that we ended up employing. We've created a common element right here. If they wanted to spend more money, the developer, they could have 
laid in uh, concrete right there. They wanted to make a good curb cut in the 15th Avenue South. And then they didn't need common elements, right? Because then they can all drive across their own limited common element to get into their space, and you don't need common elements. So from an insurance perspective, that is a better alternative. But from a practical build this house perspective, uh, the better alternative is to make this a common element here, because that involves zero extra dollars in concrete, and zero extra headaches for a curb cut. Does that sound good? Everybody kind of see the flaw with this now? Okay. Now, don't think that you're going to have to be able to spot flaws like that in the uh, site plan, because there's going to be a lot more eyes that are on this. But you're going to be one of the players on the team with a set of eyes that will see this. And as you get better with it, hopefully you'll be able to spot these things. Um, let's go back to this one. This one here is one that is kind of garden variety right up the middle. And you can see that it doesn't have uh, any common element whatsoever, right? It's just uh, divide this lot up. This is 10th Avenue North. There's your road, uh, road right there. We have an alley in the back, like we do many properties in Davidson County that are uh, being used for infill. And so they just draw one line down the middle. You have your private element, which is the footers of the property or the footprint of the home. Then you have each half reserved for the exclusive use of the other homeowner. Okay. And then look back here. It looks like they have at least a concrete pad, and that could be a more significant dwelling. Okay. Could be a guard port. I'm loving that term these days. I don't actually love the, I, I wouldn't want one so much, but I like my car being toasty when I get out there in the wintertime. But I love the term, guard port. Could be that. Could be just a, a pad off the alley. Could be fence. Might not be fence. Um, you can also see they have a big deck right here on the back of the property, and how that is not the private element. Remember a few moments ago when I told you that decks, porches, balconies, and uh, HVAC pads are usually limited common elements? That's what that shows you right there. It's also the same over the porch right up here. So that's our most garden variety, our most basic kind of uh, HVR pipe. And then there's this guy. This guy is really fun because it has, um, it shows something that is really important, even though it doesn't happen that often, okay? So it shows, you remember I told you that limited common elements can be reserved for just one homeowner or a small group of homeowners that are, is not all homeowners, right? So this one is a four unit development. It's on Emerson Avenue, uh, on that side, a hall over here, but it was one lot that kind of stretched between both of those, okay? So here's the hall. You have 1611A, 1611B, okay? And over here on Emerson, you have 1612 and 1614. By the way, I'm going to talk a little bit about addresses in a second because that's a really exciting topic for us too, just almost like you mentioned. So in this one, they have decided that there is plenty enough parking and access for uh, for Cajal Avenue for these dwelling owners up here. So I'm going to go down here to my legend. And I'm going to see that we have limited common element as to unit 1611B. That matches because that's just for that homeowner. Then you have limited common element as to 1611A. So that matches. And we have the same thing back here with 1612 and 1614. So we know that that's limited common. That's limited common to that. But you see back here, we've got a, uh, like a polka dotted area that is a, a fifth zone to the property fifth zone of the property. And if we go down to the legend down here, you can see that's a limited, and I apologize if you can't see it in TV land, but it says that's a limited common element as to unit 1612 Emerson and 1614 Emerson, okay? So that means that this area right here is shareable, but only between these two units. So that means 1612 and 1614, either one of them can come and have a barbecue back here, okay? Either one of them can park their car there, and they can do it to the exclusion of the other because it's not a purely common element. But <clears throat> Cajal Avenue occupants cannot use this area. They cannot barbecue. They cannot play. Okay? So just remember that sometimes you're going to run into those zones that have uh, special designations, and that's almost always going to be a limited common element reserved for some homeowners, but not all homeowners. Okay?
Well, let's talk about addresses just a little bit, and then we'll get into the wrap up. Um, for addresses, I'm going to use this guy. Let's see. Yeah. So on this one, this is the first one we started with. This is Summit Avenue. Um, and we normally read left to right. Okay. And so naturally, we want unit A when they have lettered designations to be on the left. And we want unit B to be on the right. But the way that uh, the Department of Public Works assigns addresses, and there's one lady in the Department of Public Works, and she was the queen of addresses in Davidson County. Her name is Bonnie Crumbly. And the way she does it is she always starts the numbers and the letters, the lowest toward the center of the city. And then they grow as they go outside of the city, okay? So I know that on Summit Avenue right here, Nashville downtown is over here because I've got unit A on this side. And I also know that this is going away from town here, unit B. That's not too bad because this is congruent with the way we're wired as humans, that A is on the left, B is on the right. That makes sense to our brains, okay? Now, if my developer goes across the street and he does the same development, okay, and he gets an A and B designation from Bonnie Crumby, he's going to blow his mind if he hasn't been to my class, okay? Because over here, unit A, being closer to the city, is going to be on the right. Unit B is going to be on the left, okay? A on the right, B on the left, all right? Now, that doesn't mean his site plan has to say that because there's two ways that those letters appear, okay? The site plan is what it is. So when he comes over here, he can have a site plan that says, this is unit A, this is unit B, because I read A to B, I'm standing in the street, and I want to see A, and then I want to see B. So he can do that on his site plan, but that's going to create a very confusing situation when Bonnie Crumbie comes in and she says, my hands are tied. Because I got to go from the center of the city to the outside of the city. So I'm going to take your unit B and I'm going to, what's, what's my address? 1021. So we're going to call it 1022 across the street. Okay. So I'm going to say this unit here, even though you called it uh, unit A in the legal description on this side, I'm going to call that 1022 B by address. And even though you've called this one B in the legal description, I'm going to call that 1022A on the address. So that's why we try our level best for the HPRs that we are creating at Ruby Title. We always vet this piece of it carefully. And so we look at the designations, we look at the layout of the street, and if it is going to create that weird circumstance, we try to get the developer and the surveyor to correct that and switch the legal descriptions. So they will match what Ronnie Crumby is going to assign as the address. But I want you to be aware of it because we're not doing every HBR in the marketplace. Other people are doing it. Uh, there are many that are already done out there. They're done incorrectly. And the most, the craziest thing that we deal with, and it happens once or twice a year, we come in, usually it's a new development too, and we have, uh, uh, we have a contract where your client is going to buy unit B. Okay, we know that it's unit B, and you've designated that by the postal address. Okay, and if it's one of those awkward properties where the legal and the address are flopped, you probably just call this. Um, well, let's go on the other side. You probably just call that 1022A because that's what the, uh, well, 1022A up here because that's what the uh, postal address says, and that's what the developer says. But if they've assigned that a wrong address, the legal description could, could be completely different. And the prior title company that assigned the other unit, sold the other unit, they could have sold the wrong unit. So they could have, they could have their deed with a legal description that sold this one, but the client actually moved into this one here. They could have this one with the uh, lender's lien with their deed of trust on it. And so that's a hard thing to walk back and unwind. One of the things that you'll see us do at Ruby Title is whenever we do a closing for one of these, our processor will print off a copy of the site plan and circle the unit that we are conveying to your client and have them initial that yes, 
I'm, when I'm standing in Summit Avenue, I plan on buying and moving to the unit on the left. That's the one I looked at. That's the wallpaper I like. That's the toilet with a flusher on the right side. That's the one I want. And so we have them circle and say, yeah, we agree because that's the one we're conveying. Because when you run into these, they're very easy. If you work with another title company, don't be afraid to, number one, meet with the company. Um, that works out in your state. Don't do that. If they're doing a great job, still put up. Um, but don't be afraid to ask them to take this step to print off a copy of the site plan and have the client initial the, I mean, have the title company and the client agree on which unit is being sold. Because that will, if every title company in Nashville did that, we would have zero problems on this issue. Zero. Okay. So with that in mind, we're going to run through this last little bit. I'm going to sit back down to do this because I think now that we're done with site plans, I can get away from the magic wall back there. Um, and commonly confused with PUDs, remember, you've got your zero lot lines that we've already touched on, the duplexes that we've already touched on, sometimes single family residences. When they're in, in areas of town that have HOAs, we know that there's communities out there, single family residences with HOAs. That can uh, create some confusion. And then condominiums, both the style before and after 2009. There's also planned unit development district overlays. And those are also in the marketplace by larger developers called PUDs. But those aren't PUDs for infill that we're talking about today, okay? Um, this is the uh, Metro ordinance that allows planned unit development district overlays. And you can read that to your heart's desire uh, later on. But you can look at what those are like Linux Village, Capital View, those are planned unit development district overlays. Those are wildly more complicated and it's a mechanism where they can go in and ask Metro to planning to do something large and beautiful and they get certain things, like they're able to mix residential and commercial and do things that you otherwise couldn't do in the bulk zoning code but they have other requirements. Like they'll say, you know, Metro planning will say, mm, you know, you need to have extra parking or you need to have a path for a bus line to come through here. Or um, because of this part of town and what we're trying to do, we want to require that you have everything be all brick in this development. You can't have anything but brick. And they can do all that stuff. So it's a give and a take between the developer and the, um, and the uh, Metro Planning Authority so that they can essentially take a magic wand and say, based on these new platypus style agreements, you can do these larger developments. But just remember when you hear of a planned unit development district overlay, that's a massive development, not what we're talking about today with PUD for infill. Okay. Uh, and then here's some examples. Okay. So you remember I told you, you can kind of look at things a little bit based on the it can or cannot be stacked issue. So if you're looking at this, what does that look like to you? Condominium or PUD? Don't be shy. Yeah, I was wrong on this one when I first looked at it. So it's okay to be wrong. Come on, be wrong with me. Looks like a PUD. That's exactly right. That was the exact thing that I said when I looked at it before I did any investigation. And then that's the reason that I put this in this development because when they built Gale Park and Mark Deutschman had a lot to do with this project, um, he decided to create it as a condominium. Now, I, you know, I haven't really even talked to him in detail about why he did that. I'm sure that he had some reason that, that is unknown to me, but Roger- Because he wanted and to make our lives difficult. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got, we got some brilliance coming through from Teddy right there. He just sure did, it, I just Roger, think that make your life difficult? It's human error because I mean, it, it, there, but there's some that were before that, I think. I mean, I don't know that it was an error, but it definitely adds some challenges here. And that's really what I would love to, Kind of kick into, and I know everybody, many have had to leave here as we as we wrap up here. But just as far as what those considerations or differences are in that, yeah, Roger, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. But Roger, what do you think? A lot of difficulties in this one, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 One unit. The, Oh, gotcha. So I didn't know that part. Yeah, I did not know that. So that Jeremy came through with some brilliance. He's unlocked a, a mystery that I've had for years. But uh, Gail Park here, they did have 
allegedly one unit that was stacked and that was the reason that they had to go condominium and not putt. Yeah, yeah, so there you go. Um, 104, 1004 Sutton Hill Road, not too far down the road from where we are right now. What does that look like? Kind of like an old style duplex, right? Kind of like an old style duplex. As it turns out, if you go to Metro Mapping and pull up uh, where you would think the declaration is, you're gonna get this flat map. If you see something like this, where you think a declaration will be, and I'm gonna give you an extra hint, this was dated back in the mid eighties. What do you think this is? If before 82, it was the zero lot line, right? Oh, zero lot line. We've got a winner out there in TV land. Who is That's that? That's two for two, two Yolanda. Person. That's Yolanda's second one. Nice. Oh, I love it. Yolanda's oh, taking goodness. notes, I can tell. Yolanda, how many cups of coffee have you had today? One half bad cup of coffee. <laughs> oh, okay, all right, all right. Well, I'm gonna keep your pump count in mind too, but you're right, that is a, uh, a zero lot line right there. Remember I said that zero lot lines are how we did this back before the mid eighties, and we can see dates on this back in the mid eighties too, and it looks like they rushed this one in and in a panic and got this one approved and uh, the permits pulled to build it right before they eliminated the zero lot lines in Davidson County. So that's over in Battlefield Estates. And that's it, guys. Um, I'm here for questions. Uh, if anybody in TV land has a question, we can do it in a structured format. Anybody in the room, we can do questions after the fact. Don't forget that everybody that attended today uh, is gonna get a copy of the Quick Facts. You're also gonna get a copy of my white paper that you can rip off and duplicate anytime, anywhere you need to. And I'm gonna give those to Teddy and he's gonna get those out. Teddy, you have any wrap up comments? Uh, just real quick, yes. Yeah. So if you're selling an HPR and the um, the nobody's kept up with the uh, corporation, nobody's paid the filing fees, do we should, how should we be preempting that as far as when we're taking a listing to check if they have followed up with that and the seller says, oh, we don't even know what you're talking about. Does that create an issue? Yeah. Or what do we need to be mindful to that when selling property? Yeah, so the townhome corporations in the state of Tennessee, they require uh, an annual shakedown fee with the state where they wanna get $20 and an annual report filed with the state, okay? Um, practically, with these zombie HOAs, nobody's doing that. Also, the solution and Teddy's question is, if we get a listing and we know that's the case where the town home corporation hasn't been maintained with the state, is that a deficiency that we need to address as a listing agent? Is that fair to say, Teddy? Is that right? Yeah. Yes. And I would say, I would say no, that is not a deficiency that you need to address. You just need to be aware of it as a potential pothole because 90% of new homeowners don't care about that piece. Um, the players to the game are lenders, title, buyers, and agents, really, to, to most transactions. And nobody in that group is uh, checking and ensuring that the townhome corporation is uh, open, alive, and active, okay? Title's not doing it. The mortgage companies aren't doing it. So until one of those two companies really step up and do it, all we're left with is uh, agents and buyers in the field that are going to check that thing. Now, if you are selling to a, um, a real estate attorney that practices corporate real estate law, then yeah, once you figure out that piece of it, you probably do need to get that fixed. Or if you're in a multiple offer situation and one of your offers is coming in from a corporate real estate attorney that practices real estate law and big developments, then you might want to steer clear of that offer. You know, you might want to think, ah, oh, you know, I might get a little more latitude over here, but also know that if you are faced with a situation where you um, you have a, you are being asked to or required to by the terms of the contract to get that cured, it is not crushing. You, the, the curative fee is you have to go back and pay the state $20 for every year that you failed, that the homeowner failed to file those in your reports. So if you're five years behind, that's a hundred bucks split between all the homeowners on that lot. If you're 10 years behind, that's 200 bucks. Correct. So are you mm -hmm. Yes, yes. But it's only because I'm a nerd and I know these things and I 
kind of keep up with it. It's not, a, it's not a big deal for me, but most of the time, you're not gonna have an HOA president like me that knows these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So what you're the question I'm hearing you ask is if you discover this issue and you and you're repping the seller. Yeah, I would say let's not try to pull this weed before it grows. OK, that's the way I would phrase it. And, and say, we don't have a buyer that's concerned about this yet. So let's not even worry about that and cross that bridge when we come to it. Because the chances are statistically more likely than not that you won't have to do anything anyway. It will not come up in due diligence. Yeah, yeah. And I think if we had a full room of people here that could raise their hands and we say out of all the HPRs and PUDs that Village has transitioned over the years. How many times have you had a buyer anywhere in a transaction that was concerned about this? We would only have a spattering of people. And so statistically, it is just incredibly low. Now, it's, I don't know, if we were a perfect uh, real estate community and everything worked well, then maybe that's something that should be addressed. But right now, it, it's just not, it's just one extra stress point that you'd be lumping on to a seller that I really don't think that they need to be dealing with. Me personally, you know, but just it, it our, our role is all about setting expectations though, right? So you just might want to set the expectation that, hey, by the way, I noticed that your uh, corporation isn't up to date. Probably won't be a big deal, but you just need to be prepared for if we get a wackadoodle buyer, they may want that updated and we'll have to do it. That's all I'd say. No, no, you just have to provide the declaration. You don't have to provide the charter and the proof of being current with the state. State of Secretary of State, by the way. Yeah. Great question, Teddy. That's one that usually comes up. So I came, came in at the 11th hour with that great question. 10-4, well, thank Any you. Will... Hey, I've got one more, Teddy. Is that all right? Yep, of course. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So yeah. So if you have a, let's say you're doing this for your own investment. Okay. And you found a home that is a single family residence and you want to preserve the existing home and make that the front home of a, a two lot development. But since this lot is eligible for a duplex, you can build another dwelling on it. And you're, you want to make the back of the lot where the second home is going to sit. We see that a lot. And you can do that. And the first step is just getting a surveyor to develop that site plan to make sure that um, by the maps and by the layouts, all that works. You know, So you just want to make sure that that happens first. And then after the surveyor has the site plan worked out, you have the surveyor's blessing that, yeah, this will work from a PUD perspective. Then you can pitch it over to an attorney like me and we can file the HDR uh, documents to get it done. Um, by the way, just so you know in your toolkit, we at Rudy, we charge $8.99 to do uh, uh, PUD documents, and that's all the way through, including the recording costs with the Secretary of State and Register, Register Fees Office. So that takes care of all of those fees. The only other fee that's not included with that would be the fee that the surveyor charges you to provide the site. That's it. So those are the steps, really. It's just survey, get an attorney on board to get all those other documents together. And we have a standard PUD that we put together with all kind of standard provisions. So as long as you don't want anything that's, you know, extremely customized, it is pretty easy and it happens pretty fast right after the surveyor gets us that final site plan. Um, if you do that, though, I recommend that you use a surveyor that is experienced with HBRs and PUDs, okay? Because so many times we'll get a surveyor from, you know, a county or two over and they've come in and they're not used to these things. So they don't, they don't know to put these designations into the site plan or the map that says private element, limited common element, all those things. But if you go out and hire Clint Elliott, his team, Adam Elliott is Clint Elliott's son 
and he's kind of taken over this portion of the business. He does a great, great job with it. Dale and Associates, they're almost like a one-stop shop and they can almost take care of the whole thing for you, but they charge you a lot more to do it. So you'll be giving them some money in exchange for their expertise. And there's lots of them in town, you know, and if you are feeling like you might have use for that, as you look at these HPRs and PUDs, just print off the site plan and throw it in a file. Every site plan that you get that you think is admirable, throw it in a file folder in your desk or throw it in that file folder in your laptop. And that way you can go back through it and you're gonna have a repertoire of all of these site plans and all of the, the surveyor stamps on it. We'll help you out. Good deal. Good question though, thank you. All right, Teddy. Good deal, Floyd. Thank you so much. Um, if you could forward that over to me, for those that want to get the documents, I will post them to the Facebook page. And um, I think that's going to be the best way for me to distribute. And we appreciate you so much, Floyd. Sorry we went long, everyone. I, I didn't know we were an hour and a half, so that's all good. And we very much appreciate the information and can be watched in the future. And I'll be posting this link to Facebook and to our uh, YouTube page as well. So. Great, great. Thanks for letting me run over, Teddy. I appreciate it. No, we appreciate you so much, Lloyd. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. All right. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.